When we talk about dating, relationships, sex, and love from a thalamic perspective, the discussion usually focuses on freedom of choice, and rightly so. How we love and how we express ourselves sexually are very deep parts of who we are. But what if I told you that most of these discussions only really scratch the surface? That focusing solely on sexual and romantic freedom might not be as helpful as it seems. You might already experience a high degree of sexual and romantic freedom and yet still find yourself in relationships that are unfulfilling, that leave you emotionally drained and trapped in unending patterns. If you're dating freely, even having sex with the people that you want, but you're still finding yourself unfulfilled, you're not alone. But what if there is a way to align your relationships with your true will, your deepest life purpose, and to finally break free of these patterns and to find fulfillment? In this video, we're going to explore dating and relationships from a perspective that goes beyond freedom of choice. We'll delve into the core of why we're here on this planet, how our souls seek to explore their universe, and why attachment and exploration are both crucial for developing a profound sense of meaning in life. Stay with me to the end because you're gonna have a whole new understanding of love, relationships, and how they can supercharge your true will. If you enjoy this video, please remember to like and subscribe. Also, please consider supporting me on Patreon. I will leave a link to my Patreon in the description for this video. Now let's look at love and thalema as you never have before. Most discussions that I see on dating, relationships, sex, and love from a thalamic perspective really tend to zero in on personal choice. The way in which we love and the way in which we have sex reflects something really deep about our true selves. For this reason, many thalamites consider a person's sexual orientation or their romantic orientation, in other words, whether they are monogamous or non-monogamous, to be something that's deeply personal and even sacred and worthy of a kind of religious reverence. And so they tend to be against any arbitrary restrictions placed upon sexuality or romance, such as heteronormativity or the normativity of monogamous relationships. The idea that consenting adults ought to be free to have the kinds of romantic and sexual relationships that they want is so widespread in the thalamic community that it's, it's almost required to believe that to be considered a thalamite. Crowley said many things in support of this idea. In particular, you could look at the new comment to see some very strident statements in favor of this perspective. And in case you're worried, I'm not going to say a single thing against this perspective in this entire video. But I think this only represents a partial understanding of love and sex from a thalamic perspective. And on its own, it may not be as helpful as it seems. You may already have the freedom to pursue the sorts of partners and the sorts of relationships you want, and yet you might still find those relationships to be unfulfilling for other reasons. For example, maybe you date a lot or even have sex a lot, but you don't find that your relationships are emotionally fulfilling. Maybe you have a history of unstable relationships. Maybe you have a history of being attracted to the wrong types of people or people who are unavailable or who otherwise are not great matches with you in the long run. Maybe you have a tendency to get into codependent or enmeshed relationships. If you've ever come out of a relationship and felt at the end of it a sense of relief that you could go back to your old hobbies and your old friends and feel more like your old self, then that's a sign that you were in an enmeshed or codependent relationship. So how can we use the idea of true will to address these sorts of problems? Let's start by doing something a little weird. Let's take a step back and let's think about why it is we're here on this planet in the first place. From Aleister Crowley's perspective, the reason that we're alive is to explore. Our souls are actually gods that exist outside of space and time. They create projections of themselves within space and time. These gods enter into the universe in the guise of mortal beings. They condense their infinite consciousness into a finite perspective that lives in a particular place at a particular time. 
They do this so that they can learn about themselves and so that they can learn about the universe. The universe is infinite. It is full of infinite possibilities. But we represent this infinite set of possibilities in a finite sequence. We represent it through experience, through bodies, through our senses. This allows us to explore. This allows us to unfold the latent possibilities within Nuit one at a time. The way in which we feel called to explore the universe is primary exploration. This is a term I got from George Haas, who runs Metagroup. That which you find salient, that which you feel called to explore for no other reason than that it excites you, that it lights up and that it lights you up, that's your primary exploration drive. Primary exploration is to be contrasted with secondary exploration. Secondary exploration is when we go out to gather the resources that allow us to engage in primary exploration. Secondary exploration is what we do in order to put a roof over our head, food on the table, and clothes on our backs. Some people are lucky. They get to do things for a living that they find intrinsically enjoyable and that satisfy their need for primary exploration. Many of us don't have that luxury. We work jobs and we use those jobs to gather the resources that allow us to go on to do the things that we love, to engage in primary exploration. You want to do just enough secondary exploration that your primary exploration does not feel limited. You really want to be doing the maximum of primary exploration and the minimum of secondary exploration. That balance is going to be different for different people, but that's the general rule for leading a fulfilling life. Primary exploration is core to our identity. It is an important expression of our true will. But in terms of psychological development, it does not come first. Human beings really only begin exploring around 18 months during what Margaret Mahler called the exploration stage. This is when they have the ability to get on all fours and start crawling all over the place and going out of the sight of their parents. But it is preceded by what is called the attachment stage. The attachment stage starts from age zero and goes up to about 18 months. It's during this period that you form the primary attachment with your primary caregiver. We know from what's called attachment theory that these early attachment bonds can have big impacts on the rest of your life, especially how you relate to the big figures in your, your life. But one of the really important impacts is how it affects your exploration. Attachment and exploration are not just simply two stages. They are also two systems within the personality or the mind. Exploration pushes you out into the world to have new experiences, to gather more resources, to learn more facts, whereas attachment pulls you back in, pulls you out of the world back into proximity with important other people. These two systems exist in a reciprocal relationship with one another. To the extent that we are out there exploring, we tend to be less attached. And to the extent that we are more attached to others, we're not doing as much exploring. But both of these systems are necessary. The purpose of attachment is to help repair and reduce some of the stress that arises from deep exploration of the world. Healthy adults tend to move in a very balanced way between exploration and attachment. A lot of relationship and life dissatisfaction stems from imbalances or disturbances between attachment and exploration. For example, if our attachment is overactivated, we're going to be constantly seeking safety through proximity to important others, and that's going to reduce our exploration and reduce our sense of fulfillment in life over the long run. Think again of that situation where the relationship ends and there's this feeling of relief because you can go back to doing the activities that you enjoy. That's a sign of an overactive attachment system that has crowded out exploration for some period of time. Alternatively, you can find yourself in relationships with people who don't understand your primary exploration or they outright reject it. And this might lead to concealing your primary exploration from the other person or compartmentalizing or even having a relationship which is ultimately inauthentic. 
And this will also lead to relationships that feel unfulfilling and aren't able to help you repair that stress from primary exploration. This is a sign of underactive attachment. On the other hand, some people might not engage in much primary exploration at all. They're workaholic. They're constantly leaning into secondary exploration. You can often find this in people who are loners or who are emotionally distant or cut off from themselves. They almost never activate attachment, so they can't avail themselves of any of the rewards that come from having a close bond with others. This means that they have to remain risk averse in everything that they do because they can't risk getting into too much trouble or stress from primary exploration. Both attachment and exploration are functions of will. They're both expressions of our underlying life force. But you cannot find meaning in life through romantic relationships. I think people sometimes read those passages in Crowley where he's talking in such glowing terms about sexual expression and love, and they might get the impression that that's where all the meaning in life is coming from. But it's not. Meaning in life can't come from attachment. Meaning in life actually comes from primary exploration. Attachment can only support it. Attachment is essential to doing your true will because it provides resources for repairing and reducing stress and lowering the risk that comes from deep, deep primary exploration of the universe. Primary exploration and the failures and the bumps and the knocks that you get along the way from that, that's how you learn about your true will. And what you want are attachment bonds that help you maximize the intensity and the depth in which you can engage in primary exploration. So how do you find a relationship that helps you accomplish this? Well, before going into that, if you're finding what I'm saying about true will to be interesting, there is a chance that you would find will discovery valuable. Will discovery is a process that I do one-on-one -on -one with you. I listen to the formative and most transformative stories of your life, and I write down the patterns in those stories and across those stories that up until now have probably eluded your notice. And then together, you and I work with those patterns to craft what's called a will statement. The will statement is an expression in a single sentence of what your finite true will is. In his essay, Duty, Aleister Crowley said that all Thelemites should begin the path by figuring out what their true will is and writing it down in a single sentence. Will discovery is a process that helps you do just that. If will discovery sounds interesting to you, click the link in the description for this video to see my availability. Now let's get back to talking about dating and relationships. So how do you go about finding the kind of partner who is going to supercharge your primary exploration and the fulfillment of your true will? My understanding of this process again comes from George Haas, as well as from Stan Tatkin, who pioneered the psychobiological approach to dating and relationships. Essentially, in the first six months of dating someone, you need to ask yourself four questions. Question number one, does this person regulate me? How do I feel when I'm around this person? How do I feel immediately after leaving this person's company? Do I feel more relaxed around this person? Do I feel excited to see them again? Do I feel at ease? Or do I feel incredibly self-conscious or jittery or nervous or otherwise unpleasant? All of that is a function of the extent to which they regulate my nervous system just by their presence. Generally speaking, someone who is good for you is going to make you feel better than you usually do. And they're not going to have to work too hard at it. Their presence is going to accomplish that for you. So that's the first question you want to ask. Does this person regulate me? And if the answer is no, find someone else. Question number two, do you regulate them? Does your presence in and of itself seem to make them feel better? Or do you have to put on some kind of dog and pony show or pretend you are someone you're not in order to make them feel at ease and like you? It is super common to have mismatches here. You regulate that person, but not vice versa, or they regulate you, but not vice versa. It happens all the time. People are often not matched well to each other. If the answer to one of these questions is no, just move on. Question number three. Do you enjoy taking care of them in the ways that they like to be taken care of? 
All of us have insecurities. All of us get stressed out about different things. And all of us have things that other people can do for us that make us feel better. Some people like reassuring words. Some people like you to cook dinner for them or take out the trash. Some of them like physical comfort or a hug. It's a little bit different for everybody. The only exceptions to this are psychopaths. If you find yourself dating a psychopath, pick somebody else. <laughs> but assuming you're not dating a psychopath, figure out what the other person needs and see if you enjoy doing it for them. Most of us have ways that we enjoy taking care of other people. If your partner or the person you're dating needs something from you that you don't really enjoy giving or doing, you're probably not going to do enough of it for them over the long run. And so that's going to make them more stressed out and ultimately resentful. So if you find that there is a mismatch here, my suggestion is that you pick somebody else. Question number four, do they enjoy taking care of you in the way that you like to be taken care of? This will require you to tell the other person what it is that you would like them to do for you. You have to tell them what you need. This is vulnerable. This is scary. I get it. But you have to do this if you're going to move on to the higher stages of doing your will. You might also have a really poor idea of what it is that you need. If you are really out of touch with your body and your emotions and the natural flow of your energy, you might not be in touch with this enough to even be able to put it into words to another person to ask for something. If that's the case, you got to figure that shit out. Also, all of that energy in the body, like that's all energy that can be used for magic that you're leaving on the table. So that's another reason why you want to be closely in touch with the natural flow of that energy. It can take a while to find somebody where you get four yeses to these four questions. For that reason, it's probably a good idea to date multiple people at once. It's okay to do that. Just be open with everybody about what you're doing. But once you have four yeses, then you have a foundation for a secure functioning relationship. That's a relationship where the both of you are actually going to be able to go out, engage in primary exploration, gather experiences, gather resources, gather all kinds of information, and then come back and share that information and repair and soothe the stress and the hard knocks that came about from exploring deeply in the world. The best kind of relationship is going to be one where there's a lot of overlap between your primary explorations. So when the both of you come back to one another, you're going to be really excited to learn about what your partner has experienced and what they learned about the universe. The two explorations are really going to come together and synergize. If you get that, that is gold. You're going to want to seal the deal on that one, whatever that means for you. That's what's called a synergistic relationship. That's where the combination of the two people is way bigger than the sum of its parts. You're going to be able to not just serve yourselves, but also serve everybody around you, your community, in a way that you would never be able to do if you were just acting alone. You can think of that as the evolutionary edge of romance. It's not mushy. It gives you, it gives you an edge on survival and gathering information and creating a picture of the universe. If you really want to supercharge your true will, you're going to want this kind of higher love that I'm talking about. It's not higher in the sense of being like super romantic or emotional. In fact, that kind of romance more often than not tends to take away energy from doing your true will. And it tends to be unstable over the long run. It's also not higher in the sense of being like abstract or intellectual or moral or something like that. It's higher in the sense of being synergistic. It's higher in the sense of creating more than what goes into it. But if you want to get there, you need to start by asking these four questions that I laid out in this video. That's going to help you pay attention to what is most important for forming that foundation that will allow you to supercharge your primary exploration and your will with the support of a secure relationship. What do you think? Does this match your experience with love and relationships and magic and true will? Let me know down in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe, and also, if you liked this video, I would bet you're going to like this other video as well that I made, so please go check it out. And until next time, love is the law, love under will.